Welcome to Capital Markets Africa. I'm your host, Chippa Muwawa. My guest today is Axel Krohn. Axel is the founder of the Krohn Fund, a global value-oriented equity fund that invests in publicly traded companies, mainly in frontier and emerging markets. He previously worked as a financial advisor for Morgan Stanley. Great to see you, Axel. Uh, hi there. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate uh, you making the time to talk to me. Um, now, Axel, you're known as a value investor, and um, I would just love to hear a bit more about, you know, what that means for, you know, how you invest um, across different markets. You know, in a sense, every investor should be a value investor, um, but I'm curious to, to, to hear, yeah, what that means for you. Uh, well, certainly, and I might disagree with you, not everybody should be a value investor because all those growth investors made so much more money uh, than us value guys. And it <laughs> seems to be being being thoughtful was not very, it did not pay off the last decade or so. Uh, but the, the, that aside, I mean, for me, what does it mean to be a value investor? And I mean, the tagline of my, on my website, what you'll see is uh, value investing without borders. And so I foremost do not see myself as somebody who invests in a specific continent or country or industry, but somebody just looks at companies, the cash flow that they generate and tries to bet the, buy those, you know, those future streams of cash flow at a very low rate. And while it kind of ignoring where the country sits, so the country might be in Sweden, but it could as well be in in Kenya or in the Philippines. And so I'm really global in my scope and it's really just looking at companies looking at that are very attractive and by my measurements and then buying shares and holding those for ideally many years. Mm. So... That is quite a wide universe, potentially. Um, give, give us a sense of, of how you go about, you know, doing that research. Um, you know, how, how do you do it efficiently? Um, also, how do you get to know these companies, you know, once you've narrowed it down to a particular pool? How do you get to know them better? Yeah, obviously, right? I mean, if the universe is whatever, 350,000 stocks, then yeah, you've got to narrow it down. And so... How do you narrow it down? I mean, first of all, I look for companies, you know, at a certain market cap and that has to be somewhat investable and should be ideally probably north of 30, 40, 50 million dollars, uh, you know, and then look for companies that have been profitable throughout long periods of time and look at companies where have that have very little or no debt. And all those things reduce the the pool quite a bit. And then you say, okay, I want a company that's always profitable, that is no debt and trades at a single digit PE, and it is growing and is paying a dividend, right? Then all of a sudden it becomes quite manageable. Now, turning the conversation to Africa, um, once you've narrowed your pool, um, are you finding that uh, the companies you're left with um, sit in particular sectors or is there quite a nice spread um, across sectors um, as well? I mean, maybe uh, right now I have quite a few investments in Africa. It's a larger part of the fund. And maybe what I should as well say, I started this in 2004. Uh, the fund and I was initially uh, very heavily invested in Africa from day one, invested in countries like um, Botswana, uh, Zambia, Senegal, and then did quite well for the next few years because I thought I was because I was so smart until I figured out, no, it was not because I was so smart because everybody else started moving into Africa, right? You had a lot of funds that were launched in 2006, 2007, and then a bunch of money flew into the markets. Markets did well. Everybody got rich uh, until they didn't, right? 
2009 to a great financial crisis, money started leaving Africa and kind of has not not come back. And all those large funds that had committed billions of dollars to equities on the continent, you know, they all imploded basically. So, and for a long period of time, for the next decade or so, I was not invested in Africa at all. And it just last two, three years that the valuations became so com compelling. And it feels like it's just when I started in 2000, 2004, that you get those uh, big solid companies at extremely low valuations. And the businesses that were always, I thought, the most the most sexy and most people other totally agreed with me were the consumer goods companies, uh, which made them unaffordable. Yet those very same companies have imploded along with the overall markets and are now, I think, yeah, ridiculously cheap. Now, one of uh, the big challenges of investing in Africa as an international investor is, you know, foreign exchange risk. Um, you know, obviously, in recent years, you know, we've seen issues in Nigeria, in Egypt. Um, how do you approach that? You know, what's your attitude to 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 that? Well, obviously, it's it, it's a problem, and I and, and I hate I hate it. Right? I mean, how can you not? Mm -hmm. uh, it takes flexibility off uh, off, off the plate, uh, but I've seen those FX restrictions come and go over over those 20 years in markets in Egypt in in other African markets in 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 Egypt and my time horizon is so long that I think I'll see through that <laughs> and so when I look at companies look at valuations markets I mean I look at it in hard currency terms right mm -hmm. I mean how much has a company taken grown revenues how much has it grown earnings in in euros in us dollars not in some crutcher nonsense uh currency but in in real currencies what other challenges are peculiar to invest in 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 africa from from your perspective well i mean i think the fascinating uh point is to put a positive spin on it is that those markets have Im imploded right i mean that they used to be vibrant stock exchanges they were trading millions if not i mean some ex instances tens of millions of dollars and now you can barely put a hundred thousand dollars to work in some markets and much much less in others mm -hmm. so that those capital markets i mean i think they're barely functioning anymore mm -hmm. So, so I guess it makes sense then to take your approach, which is, you know, buy when really when when things are really cheap and just hold it for many many years, um, because as you're alluding to, they don't seem, you know, functional um, in in some respects. So, would you say that's the only way really to 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 play the the game within African equities? Yeah, I guess. I mean, obviously, there's markets like South Africa where you can use other sh approaches, but it's not an approach. Short-term trading, I have zero skills, and I I would not use that approach in any market. I wouldn't use it on investing in the U.S. I would not invest it. Use it investing in Uganda. So I don't look at much differently. And this, when I say markets imploded, I mean, what does it mean, right? I mean, they became extremely inefficient, which is what us value investors want. Mm -hmm. And in my last quarterly letter or so, I mean, I looked at some of the consumer names that I've invested in and looked at the peak market cap and the current market cap in US dollars. And I mean, if I'll for the, show you a little, for a little treat here, Fan milk in Ghana, which I just visited and quite liked, is 62% owned by Danone in France. Peak market cap was 520 million. And as I wrote this, the market cap was 13 million US dollars. So 
98% loss in capital or <laughs> put it differently, if it had to would go back to its all time high again, it would have to go up five fifty times five zero from this level. And Unilever Ghana is 94% below its peak. Mm. I mean, so I mean, you know, that's what is that, right? 20 it would have to go up 20 times mm -hmm. uh, to reach your all time high. So you're buying incredible amount of company for very, very little money. Mm. The question is, do you find the liquidity? But I think at these prices, I mean, it's a steal. So yeah, you get paid for for all kinds of for sovereign defaults and possibly not being able to take the money out every every day i think you can pay quite handsomely by just getting those super blue chip companies that have been in the countries on the continent for whatever you know a century or whatever and will probably be there forever i mean i just met a bunch of them they're all they're all committed to mm -hmm. saying this is where we need to be mm -hmm. uh asia saturated Europe is no more growth and Africa is where you have got young people who want to eat their first ice cream. And in the case of Danone, Fan Milk Ghana, they got the ice cream monopoly. I mean, mm. what more do you want? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Now, I know you look at things on a company by company basis, but are there sort of sectors that, that you like? You know, you sort of hinted at, you know, the sort of consumer. Um, you know, sector, are there any of the sectors that you're particularly keen on and think have really strong growth prospects over the, over the long term? Um, well, I mean, as you know better than, than me, that those markets are thin markets, right? That you mm -hmm. just can't go to, uh, on the Ugandan stock exchange and say, oh, I want to invest in the next Facebook, or I would like to invest in a food delivery company or, I mean, you just got to pick what's there and uh, mm. the picking is a lot of times quite, quite slim. It's just a dozen investable companies. Um, but what I do like as well is some of the banks, uh, especially in French speaking Africa, because those, you've got a county that's packed to the Euro. Uh, and you know, managed by the French Central Bank, in effect, which is probably good for banks because unlikely that they're going to default. Uh, probably on the flip side, makes those countries less competitive. Uh, so, for in terms of production, uh, for, uh, for manufacturing, might be a little bit tougher to do that in the French-speaking Africa because you know you got the basically the Deutschmark there. Uh, but in terms of running a bank, yeah, you don't run the risk of having a bunch of sovereign bonds that default, as you've seen in in Ghana and and other countries. Now, as you look ahead to you know twenty twenty four, um, what are some reasons for optimism as you look at the African listed space, and you know reasons for caution from your perspective? Yeah, you know, reasons for optimism is probably that the thing that brought down a lot of those markets and caused problems in the economies, right, is that their countries were over leveraged and defaulted on their debt. And they seem to be, I mean, working those things out now with their creditors. And by, by 2024, those things should be a something of the past and then you know i think for the capital markets to appreciate you just need very very little basically things has have to stop getting worse uh just stabilizing and obviously i mean you and i we can pick plenty of countries that as well have positive gdp growth right as mm -hmm. We always generously, I mean, call about this continent as it be this one, uh, one country which is obviously total is bullshit, right? Uh, it's many different economies mm. growing at various speeds, and some of them obviously have been doing well throughout this. Uh, but in order to make money, we just need a little bit of more interest from 
the global capital markets. Little hundred million dollars would probably be a big de big deal for the continent, and that's something that probably moves in and out of Microsoft in the first ten minutes of the trading day. Uh, would change the fortunes of African capital markets. Yeah, and you know, with the, if money flows into the equities, of course, and if you want to buy a stock, you want to buy some Safari, come name it. Right, what do you got to do? Right, you got to you sell pound or dollars uh, to buy the local currency to buy then the shares, and so that as well should benefit the. The currencies, because that's you know, we've seen the flips are right. People sold, sold the equity, sold the currency, and converted into U.S. dollars to buy, buy some nonsense on Nasdaq, and so that should be the double whammy should be double positive. When that's going to happen, I have no idea. <laughs> Fantastic. Really interesting, Axel. Um, I really appreciate uh, you sharing your thoughts. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much.